Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. And I hope you enjoy this new show, whether you're viewing it on the internet or listening to a podcast version of the episode. I do want to thank you for being part of my audience. You can also find links to videos or podcasts on MiamiGhostChronicles.com as well as where you can submit your story about any eerie experiences you've had which I would love to hear about. Just go to the Submit Your Story tab. Please subscribe to our channel so that you receive notification of when we release a new show. And find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is where I usually live stream and where I give you a behind the scenes look at locations where new episodes are being filmed at. I also tell you about all the interesting guests that will be appearing soon on Stories of the Supernatural. I hope you enjoy the show, and I think you are all wonderful. Stories of the Supernatural, how is everybody doing today? Good, I hope. I am doing really well, and as you know, um, things here, like before, like I've told you before, South Florida, still deep summer, a lot of humidity, as a matter of fact, we just had a thunderstorm sweep through here and um, a lot of interesting things going on here. But one of the most interesting things is the guest that I have today. And let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, his name is Brian Forster and he was born in uh, Minnesota, uh, but uh, he grew up on the west coast of Canada. Now, at the age of 11, he became fascinated with the art of the Haida and other native people and began carving totem poles. Um, then he completed an honors bachelor of science degree and he decided to take up carving and sculpture uh, until the age of 25. This included creating uh, full-size totem poles, canoes, mask bowls, other types of native uh, style works. And in 95, 1995, he moved to Maui and uh, there he was uh, working as an assistant project manager for the building of a 62 foot double hull sailing canoe. We've got to ask him about that, um, which is of course, this is the ancestor of the modern day catamaran. Um, now he was involved with that f with, for two years. Um, and now where he's at right now, where I've caught up with him right now is he is in Peru. Okay, in other words, studying the culture of the Incas and this led to his writing his first book uh, titled A Brief History of the Incas and as of uh, 2013 he's written a total of 13 books and I'm going to have the links down in the credits of the show uh, as far as where you can uh, purchase them also for his website which is uh, hiddenincatours.com all right but before we get to that part let me bring him on and we can get going with this how are you doing today Brian I'm great, Marlene. How are you? Very, very good. Very excited to have you on the show. And, you know, as I, as I asked you before we started to record, obviously you had this, uh, what do you call it, this route, this, this path that led you ultimately to where you're at now, right now, uh, studying the Incas and Peru. Uh, and uh, how did you transition? What happened that, what was it what, that, that you went from from the Canadian uh, natives down to Hawaii and what was it that finally brought you over to Peru and the study of the Incas? Well actually once I finished working in Hawaii with a, a Hawaiian group um, trying to bring back a tradition that di disappeared about 500 years ago and that mm -hmm. was uh, building ocean going large catamarans capable of going to Tahiti from Hawaii because that, right. that, that used to be the tradition and uh, after that was done, I did move back to Canada, but I just I felt um, honestly just bored because I'd, <laughs> I'd spent so much time studying exotic uh, indigenous cultures and things. Right. And, and literally, I woke up one morning and the word Peru was whispered in my ear somehow. Oh, and wow. So, so I started to think, well, what's in Peru? Uh, oh, Machu Picchu's in Peru. Maybe I'll mm -hmm. go. So that's what I did. And... Uh, the first day that I was in the city of Cusco, which was the Inca capital, 
I noticed that there were megalithic structures that were profoundly well made and could not have been made by the Inca. So after looking at the archaeological literature, insisting that everything was Inca, mm -hmm. I figured out that, uh, that here was an episode of lost human history. Okay. And it just basically compelled me to keep coming to Peru to visit, and eventually I bought a one-way ticket and moved here. Wow. See, you know how many people have that dream? I love it. That one-way ticket thing. That's very courageous because, you know, there's a lot of people that, even with a whisper in the ear, they kind of balk at that. But you followed your, uh, you followed your instincts, and it turns out that... Um, so how long have you been then working down in Peru and uh, researching this area with the Incas and any of the, of the works down there, the stoneworks? Uh, I think I first came down, it was 14 or 15 years ago. Oh, and wow. I've, I, I've been living here full time now for 10 years. Okay, okay. All right, so y you know your Spanish? Uh, it's pretty good, but luckily my wife is Peruvian, so oh, she, she. Okay, you're good. So you're she, good. she does all the all the business work. <laughs> well, you, you no, know, the reason I was gonna say is because there's nothing like total immersion, and necessity to bring people oh, yeah. real quick. <laughs> oh yeah. Into knowledge of language, believe me, uh, especially yeah that that'll that that's like uh, that's the shortest uh, uh cro the path to to learning a language. Um, oh, so, definitely. When you went there, and obviously, I, it sounds like that first time that you went there, you, you had no idea that eventually you were going to live there. But what was it when you saw something that piqued your interest as far as what you identified that what you saw was beyond the something that wasn't made by the Incas, or you were surprised at how well they were done, or what was it that caught your attention? Well, it was the contrast. It was probably my second day on my first trip in Cusco, and I, I had a local guide, and he, he um, you know, he was quite knowledgeable, and he said, well, this was made by the Inca, you know, the stone building without any mortar used with perfect fitting stones where you can't fit a human hair in between them. Exactly. And then, and then next to it would be like a, a rough adobe building, and that actually was built later. And I said, well, what happened to their capability right. um, and having worked with wood and and to some degree stone for a good part of my life I just thought there's no way that a Bronze Age culture could do this okay. um, and that's that's when the mystery began and that's when I had to, to I, I had to start unraveling it because I could find no academic that understood that this work could not have been done by the Inca they were just they would just flatly say oh sure they did and it's like but you know we're talking bass salt and granite stone which is a lot harder than bronze tools you can't shape hard stone with bronze tools it's impossible and, and and you're absolutely right when everybody thinks of as far as ancient civilizations in Peru most people think of the Incas as one of the main groups that you think of especially when you see these huge temples and things like that and but a lot of people don't understand exactly what you just described that once you see it in person and you see how definite like you said how that you couldn't fit in a, a piece of paper how could a culture that only had these type of tools do that so let me ask you what you're saying is what that the culture or the civilization that did that predates the Incas yeah and luckily um, after spending quite a bit of Time in Cusco and, and then moving to Cusco after a while I started to meet some of the indigenous wisdom keepers and all of them said the same thing they said that the Inca found the city of Cusco about a thousand years ago and it was a megalithic city in ruins that had been oh. that had been damaged by a massive cataclysm and they said the Inca knew that Cusco was there but it wasn't until they were chased out of Lake Titicaca by another uh, indigenous group that they decided to go to their ancient homeland which was Cusco and then they rebuilt the city did they give these people did they know their names or did they have a name for them yeah there are two possible uh, names one is uh, a group called the we Wir okay. who were who were sent by the creator god Wiracocha mm -hmm. uh, from from the Lake Titicaca area and this was, you know, several thousand years ago. They they had incredible capabilities. Okay. And then the other possible name are what are called the Pirwas. 
And uh, if you ask most Peruvians, where does the name Peru come from? They don't know. Okay. Uh, because Ecuador comes from equator. Mm -hmm. And um, what else? Vene Venezuela actually means little Venice. <laughs> wow. And uh, Bolivia is named after Simon de Bolivar. Oh, right. And, and Argentina means little silver. So where does the name Peru come from? And it turns out Peru is named after these ancient people called the Piruas. And so when Pizarro was in uh, Panama, trying to find out where an ancient land of gold was, he was told by the local people there, you should go to the land called Peru, where, okay. where, people, where people eat off of golden plates. And that's how he found it. Wow. So, and as far as why they were driven out of the city, was it a cataclysm or did they just move? Did, I mean, did the Incas understand why the city had been abandoned? Or... Yeah, actually, the, well, actually, we're starting to get uh, geologic and scientific evidence that there was a cataclysm mm -hmm. that, pr that probably happened about 12,000 years ago. And that also relates to some of the other megalithic sites that we see around the world, um, Egypt being, another, being one of them. Uh, so that's, that's the timeline that we're looking at. And wow. so Cus Cusco was abandoned and left for several thousand years. Um, and when the Inca got there, they, they found that every megalithic structure that they encountered had incredible heavy damage to them, both uh, earthquake and also possibly solar plasma strikes. I'm, I, when you said 12,000, I was like, did he say 12,000? <laughs> that's, that's incredible. So this is really quite ancient as far as when we think of ancient civilizations or or Mesoamerica, that's that's quite a while back when you're saying that there was that cataclysm or earthquake, or whatever it was that happened. So you're saying that this civilization, in other words, was established at that time and because of what occurred uh, geologically then, you know, maybe they got decimated or they moved on, what, you know, whatever the case was. And that speaks also very well of why maybe they were so adept at engineering. Yeah, that's true. And also, um, coincidentally, the the timeline fit in with the destruction of, of Atlantis. Yes, okay. because uh, according according to Plato's account, that would have occurred eleven thousand seven hundred years ago. Right, which is very um, close. And and also from the well, I, I just used twelve thousand as a rough figure, mm -hmm. um, but um, also from uh, scientific evidence, like the work of Dr. Robert Schock, uh, he believes that this exactly coincided with the end of the last ice age, which was incredibly rapid and that the world's oceans rose by over 300 feet in a, an incredibly short period of time. And uh, what that did, because what ha happened actually is, is that part of, especially part of the North Pole, uh, the ice was, wasn't, it didn't simply melt, it was actually vaporized. And that uh, coincides with the, the whole concept of the Great Flood occurring. Exactly. Um, and so when you have 300 feet of extra water in the ocean, that increases what? a lot of pressure on the on, on plate tectonics. And so yes. dor dormant volcanoes get turned on, uh, mass, like, like massive earthquakes occur. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I, I think that's what we're looking at. Um, oh, again, that's uh, what happens when you visit Egypt as well, because you see these impossible in engineering feats next to things which you could understand could have you know could have been done by the dynastic people right so that's uh that's the pursuit and, and i was completely blown away the first time i went to egypt because of all the work i'd done in the highlands of peru you see that you know again you see cataclysmic yes. damage you see almost impossible engineering feats that we in some cases we couldn't do this work today that's you, what i think a lot of the stuff we can't do it yeah you're talking like super technology Yes, and I guess my question is the following because because sometimes I know that some people think that all these different civilizations all over the world that were able to do this type of engineering, basically they were people that left Atlantis after the cataclysm spread out and went to all these places and helped them get this knowledge. But what you're saying is they were already in place and basically when the cataclysm came about that that Atlantis disappeared, that was when they were all affected themselves. 
So basically you're saying the source of this knowledge base, which was totally out of keeping with a timeline of what you think they would be capable of knowing, has a different source, which is, are we talking then extraterrestrials? Or the big question mark, where did they learn how to do this? If yeah, well, the to, like to narrow the time frame, you know, in the in the area of, of the destruction of Atlantis, uh, I would guess that it, these were either colonies of Atlantis, or they were created um, just after the destruction of, of Atlantis. And, and the cataclysm wasn't like a one day event, even geologically. Robert Schock says it took cor uh, took place over the course of at least three hundred years. That so, long, okay. You know that's my mistake. I'm I'm a lay person when it comes to that. I I well, didn't think of it in those terms. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, most most people, you know, from disaster films, you think it's like a one day event, and yeah. New York City gets inundated and knocked down. But <laughs> it was a, it was a, a a series of events that went on, um, and I think actually that there were three different high-tech civilizations, one that did the work in Egypt, a different one that did the work in uh, the highlands of Peru, and then a third one that did work at a site called Puma Punku, mm -hmm. which is near Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, because it's it's completely different in its execution. Okay. But it's just as advanced, though. Um, in, in some ways more advanced, or really? at least at least as advanced, but it's the whole mindset that, that's involved because the work in the highlands of Peru, is it's very organic looking. Uh, it's polygonal construction, so it fits in with the landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Puma Punku is like perfectly straight lines and perfect precision angles. It's very uh, left brain mechanical, analytical. Um, and then when you get to Egypt, it's simply the sense of scale, which is, you know, mind-boggling. Exactly. Exactly. And and this is the thing you always think, what happened to this knowledge? How did these civilizations go from this level of expertise and knowledge? And then, I mean, I understand that sometimes, you know, civilizations get decimated either by conquests, sometimes even plagues, uh, cataclysms. But it seems that in these cases, all these civilizations, we still, we don't understand how they did it. And obviously from what you said yourself later on, what was built there by the natives that were there was nowhere <laughs> in the vicinity of the type of buildings that were left behind. So it makes you wonder what happened? Where did they go? What happened to this knowledge? Well, I guess the only possible answers are either that either they were destroyed because uh, when you get into Schock's theory about the plasma strikes from the sun um, then the amount of heat involved and, and we do see like the melting of, of stone surfaces that would have vaporized any life form that was in the area wow. and and would have made the areas uninhabitable for for probably 5,000 years because all like all plant life, all animal life would have simply been scorched to to nothing. Um, it's either that or they went off, you know, honestly, that or they went off planet. There's, there's no well, other right. option. It's, it, it makes you think, you know, I mean, um, sometimes you think, okay, the, you can't believe that these people just, their knowledge was just only with building megalithic structures, you know, temples or whatever. I mean, you would think it would extend to other areas how much knowledge they have of foretelling or understanding changes that were coming about that could be basically foretold. You know, did they have enough warning to get, to leave, to go to other places? I mean, you never know. Um, now, let me ask you, like, were these people, the ones that you talked about, the ones that predated the Incas, were they doing uh, any of the head binding or the elongated skulls that that we see, or was this this didn't have anything to do with them. Well, that's that's the area that I'm, I'm getting into now because there are a lot of cultures in the highlands of Peru and Bolivia who may not have been in contact with one another whose elite had elongated heads. Okay. Um, and so the most fascinating culture, uh, even the Inca, most people don't, don't understand that the Inca, the way that the Inca were uh, portrayed in paintings was 
was done after the after the Inca, uh, the conquest, right? Uh, when the when the entire Inca royal family had been wiped out by an internal civil war. Okay. So all all the portraiture we have of, of the royal Incas now is based on Spanish painters in Cusco after the destruction of the Inca people. Okay. Um, but what uh, the research that I've been able to find out is that the Inca nobility did have elongated heads, and they also had dark red hair, uh, which really? is not genetically characteristic of being a, a Native American person. No. And um, I had heard recently, I want to say in some, in New Zealand or, was it New Zealand or in some of these Polynesian islands that they had also some Natives with those same genetics, which was uncommon. In other words, with the red hair, and in some cases the light eyes, and they were even a discussion about, you know, how far some of these peoples traveled, as how far away they actually went. Which yeah, I yeah. Oh, sorry, but yeah, there's there's a lady who's probably in her mid sixties now, or maybe seventy. Her, mm -hmm. her name is Monica, and she genetically has red hair and light colored right. skin, and her bloodline. She she knows from her oral tradition her bloodline goes back from before the time of, of the, the Maori um, appearing in New Zealand about a thousand years ago. And she even had her DNA tested, and she's 30 to 40 percent Persian. Wow. So that means a major, that's a major migration. Yes, that is. Um, does, do you, was there any um, explanation as to why the royal family would do the the thing with the skulls, the elongation of the skulls. What what was the meaning of it, or why would they do that? Well, the main thing, if you, if you look at uh, different cultures around the world, it was most common about two thousand years ago, and um, we're talking Europe and uh, the west coast of Africa, Melanesia, even the Maya um, and the Inca and other people in in Peru. It was a way to make the nobility physically look different from the commoners okay okay so that's why the head binding was done but the, but the of course the question is where did it come from right and um, any oral tradition that still exists amongst these people states that that's what the ancestors looked like as in it was a genetic thing okay all right yeah I imagine after a time it's the, the reason is lost it's just it's done based right. on tradition but the original as to why it was that particular thing was done uh it just gets lost in the as the years go by now let me ask you as far as um because that's so interesting that this culture this civilization that predated the incas all the mummies and everything that that have been found those are incan or did any of the civilization did they just totally disappear have any mummies been found that belonged to their time period i mean even though that's really far back yeah, well, I, unfortunately, there is to some degree cover up that that happens from um, institutions and governments. So really? I I do know, well, oh, I, I I do know that there's a massive collection at the main archaeology museum in Lima, which has more or less a warehouse of fifteen thousand ancient Peruvian skulls. Um, quite a few are elongated, and I heard quite recently that um, a Canadian filmmaker was invited to Peru in the 1990s in order to bring back, uh, to make films to bring back tourism, because that's when Peru was suffering from what was called the Shining Path, which was this Maoist yes. terrorist organization. Yeah. And and, um, and so Fujimori, who was the president at the time, he invited this filmmaker to, um, to make these documentaries, and um, this guy, for some reason, knew about the elongated skulls, and so he asked if he could get access to the to this vast collection, which of course the president, if he says yes, you can do anything, and he um, he doesn't like to sp uh, to talk about it anymore. But he said that there were skulls he saw in some of the back rooms that were at least two and a half times the size of a normal human being. What? And he no. was even, even he was even given uh, given a cast copy of one, which he has in his house in Toronto, I think. He better keep that under lock and key. No, I think so. <laughs> but okay, and I'm going to ask the obvious: why, why the secrecy? Why? What? What would be the problem with that? 
Uh, well, the problem is it, it doesn't fit in with the basic um, archaeological paradigm. So again, oh, that's why. Oh, okay. So, so that's why the academics still insist that the Inca made all the uh, megalithic work, and uh, there was there was no civilization before that because they don't want to change the history books. But unfortunately, it's something that has to be done, and that's kind of one one of my pioneering roles is to, um, you know, expose this information <laughs> to whoever wants to listen to it because it's. The, you know, the longer time goes on, it's it's not that like I have a theory that I'm defending. It's simply that the data keeps coming in, which right. is building on top of itself. So, yeah, yeah, and, and and you're absolutely right. Sometimes what it boils down to is people's ego, where they would have to say, "Oh, we were wrong," and some people really have a hard time doing that, especially when they're really wrong, <laughs> and yeah. they've they've stuck to it for a long time. And how do you backtrack from that? But um, yeah, well, also, especially now that we have access to, um, you know, very sophisticated, sophisticated technology like DNA testing, mm -hmm. then w which we've done on the elongated skulls on the coast of Peru here, okay. then that, you know, that is evidence that can't be refuted because I mean, that's science, that's numbers, that's data. Exactly. Right. That's not like conjecture. Or we think uh... now <clears throat> were the now I'm questioning everything, the Nazca lines, and, and I heard recently that they discovered other lines that because of satellite that they were able to see that were, weren't visible before. Are the origins of those lines Incan or before? Uh, no. The, the, uh, actually, that's, you know, the story itself is fascinating because I, I honestly, I, I live about 20 miles from one of the largest of what are called the geoglyphs, you know, mm -hmm. the a animal shapes. Right. This is called the can this is called the candelabro, which is a uh, it's a trident shaped geoglyph. It's about 500 feet tall, and it's on the side of a mountain that can only be seen from the air or the ocean. Right. So the basic story behind that, of course, people talk about the Nazca, which is true, but um, the the line system. Uh, and geoglyph system goes from Paracas Bay, which is close to where I am, to Nazca, and that's a distance of 150 miles. So there are wow. about 1,700 of these geoglyphs and lines in in total. And the, and as you said, they're finding more and more thanks to satellite and drone technology. Exactly. That's and that's the thing. You think why would they expend this manpower, this effort? It's the it's, I don't know. It just, I can't think of it as just being ornamental, I guess is what I'm saying. No. There's got to have been some purpose to it, especially, I imagine, the work it would have taken. And I wasn't even aware that there were so many. That's yeah, they cover, they cover more than, a, oh, much more than 100 square miles. And uh, they were made over the course of a thousand years by two different cultures. The first culture was called the Paracas that had the largest elongated skulls in the world and they they were making them from 500 BC to 100 AD and then the Nazca people moved in and took over and they kept creating them for another 500 years so you have you know you have a, a huge number of them and you have a thousand years of construction so the reasoning behind why they were, were made depended upon the culture and the Honestly, also the climate at the time, because this area has been turning into desert for the past uh, 2,000 years. Wow. And I guess, I mean, I've never been to Peru, but I imagine, I don't know if the geography, is it that easy really as far as to make, I, I, I still think even though it was done across, it, it would take manpower, it would take time, it would take effort. Um in other words, I don't think any civilization does that for no reason unless it has some deep significance that they were willing to to do it in such a way that they would have to. Because I imagine back then, you know, you had your your people that would be working, whether if they were soldiers or farmers or artisans, you know, you needed your people to be working for what you needed, whether it was food or whatever. So if you were putting off these people to do this work, which was I imagine pretty intense you had to have a good reason for it oh definitely and also um the nazca area only gets half an inch of rain a year wow so That's so growing 
uh, growing food was was basically a, a advanced science to these ancient people because there is no surface water; it's all underground. And so, in order to to feed a, a large, uh, you know, reasonably large civilization, takes an incredible amount of um, of intense activity. So, they must have produced a phenomenal amount of food in a very desert environment to allow for the construction of some of these figures that are several hundred feet long. Yes. Yes. And let me ask you, they don't have, they have not left behind any type of writing or as far as explanations, or is it just symbols? Um, it's, yeah, it's symbols, but also some of the lines relate to the solstices and equinoxes. So they're these giant, long, straight as an arrow uh, paths. Um, others were used as straight roads, and others were used to actually map the underground water system. That's why it's been very difficult to come up with a very specific theory as to why the lines were made, because they do go off in all sorts of different directions. They're not all east to west or north to south. Uh, but I think uh, it's because the, the water comes from the Andes mm -hmm. and, and then travels underground uh, and then and eventually empties into the Pacific Ocean. So, so they had to be able to map and, and track where the streams were in order to be able to access abundant water for their, uh, you know, for their agriculture to feed what was actually quite a big population in, you know, yes. one of the driest deserts in the world. Yes. And that's, again, that's, that's incredible that, you know, that they understood because you think, you know, not only astronomy, as far as if you're, you know, we're talking lining up stars and, you know, the equinox and solstice, et cetera, but that they were able to map uh, the underground sources so that they could get to water and keep the population alive, not just drinking water, but um, the day, what, what were they using? Did they construct aqueducts? How was it that they were doing this? Because I know in Mexico they had you know, different systems. Well, it was, it, does, it wasn't obviously desert. They, they had different problems, but how was it that they were getting to this water? Well, actually, that's a really fascinating uh, story. There, there are these spiral wells that go down. They're called um, contayocs or, okay. or pukios. And it's, it's like a spiral well that goes down, uh, quite ergonomic. So it's pretty, uh, there are about 12 of them still in existence. And uh, they would go right to the center of where these, these underground streams would be, and that's where they would collect the water, uh, and then they would very intensely grow the food in close proximity to these um, underground water sources. Okay, okay, which makes a lot of sense. But yeah, because, but yeah, that, 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 that's, to me that's fascinating because it's people that are living in the environment, making the best use of the environment as it is at that time, but at the same time, expanding it to make it, how can I say, more comfortable living, not just a hard scrabble life. And obviously having enough time that they were able to inscribe and do all these different types of drawings. And we come back to the building of these megalithic structures, which I imagine, even if we somehow understood or knew how they did it that must have been so work intensive i imagine just from the planning stage onward uh it's it boggles the mind how they were able to do that oh i know i know that's well that's the one you know peru is quite a small country but the the number of en enigmatic mysteries here is uh quite amazing uh, let me ask you, I know that Machu Picchu is, is, are we talking the same people? Are we talking a different time era as far as the structures? Uh, actually, Machu Picchu is a fascinating story by itself because, again, the, you know, you go, the, I've been there 67 times so far. You know, <laughs> it never, never loses its, its charm because it is on top of a mountain in the, in the middle of the high jungle. And it was an astonishing Inca accomplishment. Uh, but what we see there is the same thing. Um, the core part is megalithic, okay. and then the outer outer ninety percent is Inca. You can distinguish between the two styles very like very easily. Uh, so obviously, what happened was the Inca found an abandoned megalithic site, and they were okay. blown you know blown away by it. They 
decided, well, we should build something here because our predecessors, you know, were here. I did not know that about Machu Picchu. I thought that was strictly Incan. I had no idea that there was some type of structure that predated that. Yeah, well, I, it's true, actually, of, of all the major Inca sites. There's another uh, location just outside of Cusco called Sacsayhuaman, which is this giant zigzag wall, and the Inca found that, too, and then they built a massive ceremonial center around it, and then Oyente Tambo is another location where they did, uh, the Inca did incredible terraforming of the sides of mountains, but there is a temple, or what we call a temple, on the top, which is composed of six blocks that each weigh 60 to 70 tons. Oh my God, that's incredible. And has anybody explored why these sites were chosen originally by whoever built there? Was there any significance? Have they found any, as far as the placement, do they line up with something? They do actually, they, they line up perfectly along, all the megalithic sites in general line up along this one specific line which uh, is called the path of Viracocha. So that, there we get back to the creator god again. Okay. Uh, so, so all of the sites from Cajamarca, which is in northern Peru, nor, yeah, northwestern Peru, uh, all the way down to Lake Titicaca, all of the major megalithic sites, including Machu Picchu, are almost exactly on this, this energy line. Okay. Okay, so there was, so... Yeah, and, and it's understandable why the Inca, not only that they, they find those previous structures, but they understood the significance of why they were there to begin with. And they decided yeah, they to go did. there. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the Inca had, had a system, uh, an energy system, which is inherent to the landscape called Seke lines. And along, it's, it's like radiating lines that come out from Cusco. And along those lines, all of the sacred sites that the Inca had were located on those lines. So the, they understood the concept of earth energy, okay. uh, which makes them much more finely tuned than we are in, in terms of um, you know special aspects of, of uh, thought processes and intuition. Yes, no, obviously they, they use that because I think we lost it because we just stopped use it you know thinking you following our intuition you know we dismiss it as imagination and, and over there i'm sure it was probably done every minute of every day by every person that you were more in tune with what was going on around you with the nature with the land etc and did they have and i well i'm gonna i'm not gonna assume as far as any uh special or sacred significance for lake titicaca um yeah lake titicaca which is one of the uh, which is the highest navigable lake in the world. Uh, it's at thirteen thousand feet above sea level. There's a lot of strong evidence that the Inca actually began on the islands of the Sun and Moon in Lake Titicaca because they they totally terraformed the island of the Sun. It's incredible, um, and uh, they probably coalesced as a group beginning about maybe a hundred A.D. And so for for the next nine hundred years. They uh, perfected their art of, um, of agriculture. And so when they were chased out due to a, a drought that uh, uh, took four, uh, was 40 years long, they were chased out by uh, another group called the Aymara, who were the people who live there today. That's when they were forced to leave, and uh, that's when they found uh, Cusco and rebuilt it as their center. Okay. And um, Brian, let me ask, because I know that because of your background, you know, you, you worked with the native art in Canada and then you were in Hawaii for a bit. Have you ever seen any type of tie-in or similarity of anything between these different cultures? Uh, no. Much feel... minor. I'm sure that not, not big, but anything that you would say, God, I've seen something like this before. Uh, no, but it's actually the, the migration patterns are actually quite fascinating because okay. with the red ha- with the red hair, and we're, yes. we're talking dark auburn. We're not talking carrot top, you know, mm-hmm. Irish people. Okay. So it's a, it's it's a completely different bloodline uh, from the Europeans. But um, right. you do find uh, mention of the red hair in on the coast. Well, in the highlands of Peru, on the coast of Peru, Easter Island. Tahiti, Mm -hmm. New Zealand, and Hawaii, and when you trace red hair back to its source, uh, the source location is the Middle East. 
Wow. So that's um, and actually the uh, the DNA results that we got are really interesting because the Paracas people, <clears throat> which is where I live, they they were this culture again with enormously elongated heads, and uh, they lived between about a thousand BC and one hundred AD. Uh, genetically, they're related to people who lived in the Black Sea and and uh, Crimea at the same time. That's incredible. It is. That is incredible. Do you think, I mean, as far as the skulls, this they had to bind them. There was nothing genetically at some point where the skulls, the, 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 there was no genetics involved with that elongation. It was strictly binding. No, actually, that's, that's what's really interesting is the oldest ones that we found are natural in shape. Okay. And then, the, and then the more recent ones were, were bound. So I think what you had was you had originally a bloodline of, of people who were born with elongated heads. And then as time went on, especially by the time they reached the coast of Peru, then they, they had to start breeding with other people because right. otherwise that, that, you know, that have major genetic problems. And so mm -hmm. it was the, it was the breeding with normal people that over the course of time caused the binding to have to be done. Oh, I see. Um, and uh, uh, also some blood tests that that were done about 40 years ago from mummy bundles from the coast of Peru showed that their their blood types were um, quite different from those of uh, normal native people of of Peru from 3,000 years ago. Really? Wow, that is incredible. And, and and I want to say because you kind of see this where these. Um, whether they were the royal family, they're very, uh, they want to keep their bloodline within themselves. I know that, like you said, that because of intermarriage, they, you know, ultimately they have to bring in new bloodlines. But at the same time, they were very, uh, they took care of trying to keep that bloodline or those characteristics within the royal family. Like you said, so that specialness to be part of being a royal or the ruling class. Yeah, that's right. And actually, in the in the case of uh, the Inca, it was the same the same situation occurred. They they were quite a genetically uh, relatively small population, and so um, the high the high Inca or you know the ruler the high, right. high Inca he his first wife had to be a relative um, okay. because that way you continued the you know trying to concentrate as much of the ancestry as possible. But then he also would have other other wives if, if he so chose, and right. they would be chosen from the finest of, of the women that existed from uh, the other cultures that the Inca began to envelop. So okay. that's where my, my recent teachings come from. My great mentor who lives in Cusco, uh, Dr. Teo Paredes, who knows much, much more than I do at this point, but what he stresses that the, is that the Inca... Uh, the Inca royal family, who were the Inca, the general population were not the Inca, but the royal family stressed quality in all things, and okay. so that that included that included themselves. So what he says is, uh, they were great at experimentation. Initially, what they did is they experimented with plants in order to get as many varieties as possible for. Uh, the different microclimates. So they developed 3,000 kinds of potatoes wow. and and more, m many more than 200 kinds of corn. And uh, after that is when they started to experiment with animals. So that's when the whole thing about the um, the use of the of the alpaca and the llama and the guanaco and the vicuña, who were uh -huh. the the camelid am animals that were used for all sorts of different things that ex they started experimenting with the animals in order to get higher and higher quality of them and then the final step was in terms of the of the genetics of the people so they you know they they um, they thought that the great qualities of humanity were grace and beauty and intelligence and everything like that so uh, right. yeah you know the, the Inca story for me is it, it it keeps going on and on because uh, initially, you have to use the Spanish uh, conquistadors' chronicles mm -hmm. to, like, to begin your elementary study. But then after that, it's finding local people who still remember or who are still the wisdom keepers in order to learn more. And it's uh, it's still fascinating to me. 
No, absolutely. Now, let me ask you, I know the Incas did some type of human sacrifice. Did any of these other prior civilizations before or after, did they also practice it or was this strictly the Incas? Well, actually, a lot of, of the stories of human sacrifice among the Inca was made up by the Catholic Church. Are you serious? Oh, don't yes. say that. That's a horrible thing to do. <laughs> it is. Well, it's, it's a way to destroy a culture, is, is to make up stories. Yes. So I found, I've actually found very little information that, uh, that is solid about the, the Inca doing human sacrifice, because when, when you think of human sacrifice, what are you trying to achieve? You're probably trying to achieve uh, special treatment from the high, you know, from the creator in terms of you're having crop failure or something. Right, like right. That. That's what I was going to ask you. If they did it, was it because there was something going on, like exactly like what you said, uh, some type of problem with the weather, you know, no food, which is like, okay, we're going to go to extreme measures. But from what you're telling me, that's not the case. No, from the historical record, there were never any great, like, general calamities prior to the arrival of, of the Spanish. The Inca were so good at, at agriculture, they, they planted plants from the valley floor to the tops of mountains. So that, again, you have all these different uh, microclimates. And, and uh, by the time their uh, culture reached its peak, the Inca world stretched from southern Colombia to the middle of Chile and Argentina and into the Amazon. So again, you have thousands, if not tens of thousands of microclimates. They had a system of 25,000 uh, miles of, of roads and trails that connected all of their villages and towns together. So movement of, of food and other things was very efficient. And they were absolute masters at agriculture. So uh, it's believed that at their absolute height, the Inca general population was 15 million people, and they had what? enough food, and they had enough food stored for four years for those 15 million people. That's incredible. That's it is incredible. Yeah. You're right. You're absolutely right. You have the logistics to be able to do the logistics, whether it's from the moment of planting, harvesting, storage, for four years for that amount of population. That's incredible. Yeah, and they had these massive warehouses located in strategic places, the sizes of, of actually small cities that were used solely to store the, like to air dry and store food. Uh, so they they did not, they never lacked anything, and uh, they had no reason to you know be superstitious and try to appease the the Creator no. God because no. that's actually who they praised every day. They're, they, you know, people call them a sun worshiping culture, but it, it wasn't that. It, they understood that the sun symbolized uh, life and creation, so they used the sun as that symbol. But they knew that the actual creative force was something far beyond uh, what what simply the sun was, but was the creator of the sun itself. So, Brian, I mean, then what happened? Was it the arrival of Europeans? in Peru, the discovery, is that what led to that civilization or was it already in decline? What happened? Well, it's a series of events that happened, that began to happen five years before the Spanish arrived. And that's that um, the Spanish main center was in Panama. That's where the ships would arrive from Spain. And uh, so people, native people were trading even prior to the uh, time of the Spanish. It, like, it was like a network that went all the way from Panama to Peru. So unfortunately, once the Spanish arrived and established themselves in Panama, then they brought with them uh, disease. Yes. And the, the disease was automatic, or very soon transferred to the local population. And so those that went from the local population on trading missions to the next group of people, yes. that's how the, the chain of disease happened. It wasn't like handing out blank, you know, it wasn't a deliberate thing. Right, it right, no, I know happened. exactly what you mean, but yes, yeah. That, 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 and, I, I, and, yeah, yeah, so what happened was, was Huayna Capac was the last of the great Inca, and, and he was actually living in Ecuador because his um, his his favorite wife lived there. She was, she was the high queen of the ancient Ecuadorian people. And so he and his firstborn son 
caught smallpox, and within, within three days, he was on his deathbed. And so, unfortunately, he made the decision to divide the Inca world into two pieces. And so he gave his son Atahualpa, who was um, half Inca and half uh, Ecuadorian, he gave him his mother's land, which encompassed basically the country. Okay. And, and, then, and then he gave the rest of the Inca world to his other high son in Cusco called Huascar. And uh, then, then uh, Juan de Capac died, and uh, the two brothers um, had an uneasy relationship for about five years, and eventually they went to uh, they went to war, civil war. And by that time, the smallpox had wiped out half of the Inca population. Wow! And then the the civil war basically just destroyed everything, and that's when the Spanish arrived, and then they took sides with the northern brother. And okay. uh, that's that's when the Inca were were uh, ruined, right? Was yeah. by by that. Yeah. Though, so they were already in trouble because of internal or civil war. And yeah. Yes. Which was which was initiated by the by the diseases coming in. Exactly. Ex yeah. It's in, in other words, as far as the timing, as far as when the Spaniards arrived, for them it would, couldn't have been better as far as the least resistance versus a unified country with you know no no internal strife and of course but the the health problems that's a whole nother thing altogether which has decimated basically part of your population oh exactly at least half of the population was was gone by the time the spanish arrived and that that would have caused um societal chaos as well because some of the great leaders were gone so who, who was organizing what and uh, that's why I, I wrote my first book. I've actually written 35 now, but my, oh my, my first God. book was... <laughs> my, my, right, okay. My, my first book was, was trying to find out this, you know, like you had 160 Spanish. The Inca had a standing army of 100,000. How, did, how you know, did that how does that How does that work? And it was because of the, all the diseases. As the Spanish uh, continued to move southward, they kept... It, encountering abandoned villages and stuff like that. And they simply took advantage of all of this chaos in order to yeah. uh, take control. Yes, yes. There's nothing like... And I want to ask you, do, cause I, do you think or do you suspect, are there any undiscovered cities, hidden cities in Peru? Uh, there could be in the eastern flank of the, uh, the very high jungle. So in, in the region where Machu Picchu was found mm -hmm. about 100 years ago, there, there could be other sites. Um, there's another like large city that was never found by the Spanish as well called Choquequirao, but it's, it's very difficult to get to. But that's part of my work again is, is through local experts um, is to see if, if there are other major centers that still have not been found. and, and we have a new uh, technology called lidar, mm -hmm. which is like which is a uh, an air airborne technology that's able to map uh, into the canopy. So that's why right. major Mayan sites are, are now being found that were never right. found before because they they simply look like natural formations from a distance, and the, the jungle is so thick. Well, that, uh, let me tell you that the reason why I asked you is I mean I live in a subtropical climate, Not, nothing like a jungle, but I know firsthand how quickly vegetation and i mean quickly can overtake things so i'm thinking hundreds of years it can obliterate any sign if you're looking with your naked eye kind of thing any sign of huge structures i could see how very easily that could happen so that's why i was curious I, i'm thinking there's got to be things hidden under some of those jungles oh yeah i'm, I, I'm i've been sent photographs by by people who live in in villages in uh, the upper area of the of the highlands uh, jungle and they, they've shown me um, you know megalithic walls and things like that that I, I want to go explore is just these these places are very difficult to get into because as you said the original Inca roads that went in there were would have been totally covered in jungle within less than a hundred years so yes. how do you even access them yes let me and, and and have you and I from what I understand also some of these locations the air is very thin as far as breathing you know, exertion. Uh, I imagine you're used to it by now, right? 
or yeah it it still takes a bit of time to get used to because Cusco is about 11,000 feet above sea oh my God, level that's incredible that's... so when you fly from Le like Lima's right on the ocean so you in an hour you've gone from sea level to two miles above, <laughs> above wow. sea level so that takes a bit of um of time to get used to and then Lake Titicaca is at 13,000 and it's about twice as as difficult but the, the high jungle area we're talking maybe seven like seven thousand feet up so it's um it's actually quite a nice environment but the jungle is so thick that there is not a square inch where you don't find a, a plant growing so yes packing your way into into some of these ancient sites would be difficult uh, maybe if funding if we find yeah. some of these locations and funding can can come through then we can do reconnaissance work with helicopters from the Cusco airport which would be great right. And uh, let me ask you, because I know everybody thinks, myself included, that some of these megalithic or these ancient sites are out in the jungle. Have they discovered anything under any of the already existing modern, more modern cities? You know, where well, I know sometimes they do digging and surprise. Uh, they have a discovery that's quite, quite old. Yeah, actually, the, there's a whole series of tunnels that exist under Cusco because I've been in parts of them. And uh, they're they're all sealed off now because it's the the church did that in the early uh, part of the 16th century when they were there just because um, so supposedly there were tunnel systems that go on for miles, and my my friend Teo who was born in Cusco, and he's um, he is Inca on his mum's side of the family I think, and then he's Spanish on his father's side, so his his Spanish part of his family's been in. Cusco for at least 200 years, and he says that there, there is a city under the city. It's just access is impossible because now it's a modern city. Exactly. Yeah, it's been built over. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine that, that that's... I wouldn't be surprised. Absolutely. I would not be surprised. So right now, what what is your most current project that you're working on, Brian? Is it is it more research into the elongated skulls? It sounds like the genetics. That's fascinating. Like you said, now with DNA, uh, they can map out better the origins or the differences between one group versus the other. Um, yeah, it, it's actually a bunch of different things. It, it tends to be that um, one area w will you know be all of a sudden a new discovery will happen and it's like, oh, focus there. And then, then that kind of dies down and then it's, oh, turn over here and do this. So with mm -hmm. the, uh, the DNA testing, that, you know, that process cost a hundred thousand dollars. And, know, uh, so <laughs> we just, uh, you know, you don't realize it that, that yes, that I imagine processing something like that. Yes. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to work at, at doing crowdfunding for, uh, there are some elongated skulls in private collections in this area, so that way I, I don't have to, like we had to get permission from the Peruvian government to do the DNA testing because okay. we're talking, uh, you know, 500 plus pre-Columbian artifacts and things, but I was told by the government that um, skulls from private collections, they don't really care about. If, if I want to, I can go ahead and, and do the DNA testing because they don't know the provenance. They don't know exactly where the you know where the skulls came from. Okay. So uh, so yeah, I've got three candidates so far to do, and the price has gone down a lot. Now it's about seven hundred dollars per sample. I've got the lab in Canada that uh, will will do the work. So I'm slowly working on that. Uh, but my wife and I are going back to Cusco in two weeks. We have a tour that's focusing on the elongated skull. So that's um, that's looking at at the Inca and the and the pre-Inca people of the highlands and then coming here down to the coast and doing Nazca, uh, flying over the Nazca lines and also going to the museums that have the elongated skulls here. Uh, so that's basically what's in, in the, the near future. And let me ask you something, Brian, when, when a person goes on a tour, let's say, do you take them to locations where the skulls have been found or where, where is it that you take, uh, let's say, if somebody goes on the tour with you? Uh, mainly to the to the museums and the uh, megalithic sites. Um, okay. I, I, there is one location where the there's actually only one location where the largest elongated skulls in the world have been found, and we used to take people there. But it's a uh, it's a very sacred place to me now. So, okay. um, 
my wife and I go there maybe once a month because there's still quite a bit of active grave robbing going on. Oh my God. So we, we go there to take photographs to uh, submit to the Peruvian government to say uh, the site should be protected more. Um, but yeah, it's just an ongoing process, going back to Egypt in April and uh, probably going to India because there's a lot of me megalithic stuff in India that most people don't know about in January. And then uh, uh, Mexico is becoming quite fascinating because I found some megalithic aspects of uh, locations in Mexico that most people don't know about. Right. Uh, yeah, I heard something recently that they had found under the city of Mexico proper, you know, the the they're you know that they had some they had found certain catacombs with with skulls but they found now a more a, a larger area basically thousands in other words you're discovering all the time and this is just under um the main city uh i mean many many years ago i went to chichen itza and that was fascinating and uh that was i, I haven't had a chance to go back and let me tell you, people don't realize when you look at some of these structures on the television, when you're there in person, it, they're, they're huge. And like the stairs, and you think, how could they do it? How could they go up and down these things? And it's just totally different when you're there in person. <laughs> I don't care how, I don't care how good your widescreen or, you know, whatever it is. It's nothing like when you're in front of a monument of that type. No, that's that's completely true. You you probably pick up a hundred times more information being on location because then then you can really go up to things and look at them. Yes. Uh, I think probably the most recent thing is we <clears throat> we did a tour in Mexico in January and then uh, everyone went home and my my wife and I decided to go to Oaxaca just for three days and we found a site there called Mitla, which in photographs it, it kind of looks impressive, but you know, you don't really know. And when we got there, we found these buildings that had be like basalt stone beams that weighed, uh, at least 10 of them that weighed six tons each. Wow. And uh, an another one that weighed uh, 10 tons and, and one more that weighed 18 tons. And they don't fit in with the construction because um, it's like looking at night and day. So that's obviously an ancient megalithic place that uh, I think the Zapotec people found at some point and built a ceremonial city. So that's the main commonality all in all these ancient places is structures that are far older than you can even imagine then yes. being found by a culture we understand and too right and let me ask you real quick that you mentioned about the grave robbing of that location <clears throat> were they were they mummifying their dead or or what are they doing as far as the grave robbing? I mean, are they breaking into tombs? Yeah, actually, the uh, the Paracas were very good at um, at um, mummification, and okay. so there there are four four uh, known royal cemeteries in this area. Uh, where, where only the nobility were buried. And so the oldest one, I th the, the archaeologists don't agree, but they've never done um, carbon-14 testing. But I think the oldest site is where these largest elongated skulls are found. And so that's a place where uh, it's more or less in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so that's why at night tomb robbers can go and, and uh, you know, right. yeah. break into tombs and then rapidly take out the remains and are gone before dawn kind of thing. Right. Yeah, that's that's understandable. Unfortunately, that's I can see that happening. Nobody there to 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 make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and I think that's so fat. I, I mean, what you said about you know all these civilizations that predated the Incas and um, that there's so much mystery there. You know, the, for all that you said that is known about them, there is also so much mystery about them. And of course, how they were able to do the things that they were able to do. And I think that's a mystery that we see constantly from different parts of the world. Like you said, Egypt, for example, that we still don't understand how they were able to do that. I mean, I look at that, I'm like, okay, besides, you know, if you're looking at the engineering part and the planning and, and sand, 
<laughs> or in let's say in Peru up the mountain it's like how did they do this uh, it's still it's it, it just in and, and then of course you're thinking without the use of let's say modern machinery like we have now and then of course we come ultimately to the question which is where everybody goes was did they have any type of help uh, was this done by extraterrestrials did they do that did they show them something and having to do with magnetics I mean it's a big giant question mark but obviously the mystery there is like it's deep in other words yeah well that's that's what keeps me here because obviously I haven't found everything there's there's always more and more to to see and uh, the great thing about the tours is that they're not you know, I guess he used the term tour, but it's they're basically scientific and metaphysical expeditions. And so uh, my whole purpose is on each tour, I, I have to learn something new. Otherwise, there's no point in me doing it anymore. And fortunately, we tend to have, uh, at least to some degree, engineers and medical doctors and uh, even physicists come with us. And so I, I actually learn from them because they're okay. the ones looking you know, at these places for the very first time with absolute awe. I bet. And so I, I get to ask them, well, what do you, how do you think this was done? How many times are you answered with one of those? I have no idea. <laughs> it's like, I imagine that it's like, it's, it's, I think that even if you do have a background in physics or engineering, or you're one of these people that you have to look at some of these places and go, I wish I knew <laughs> it's, because it's just the sheer volume or like you said just the weight of let's say one piece of stone just one how did they do it how did they lift it how did they maneuver it how did they put it in place uh and then put one on top of it. it's like it's incredible yeah it is but anyway brian i wanted to thank you so so much for spending this time today it has been fascinating um everything that you explained as far as what really was or is the background the history uh of the civilizations and like you said despite all the answers that we're getting even now with genetics there is i think so many mysteries that are waiting to be solved out there uh well, that would give answers to a lot of questions that people have had for a long time no, very true, and that's why for me it's very important to ask the the indigenous people what you know. If you can tell me, what do you remember or what do you know of this? And the stuff that comes out is just, you know, has never been written down because it's oral tradition. Right. That's what I was but about to say. This is passed down. down through oral tradition, right? This is not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. and often not shared with uh, archaeologists because they come with this Western stilt to you know how, how they look at things. They mm -hmm. they don't believe in anything to do with um, extrasensory capability or spiritual energy or whatever so if you don't if, if you can't believe in that stuff which is what they're telling you then right. you'll never unravel it because you, you have to see it from the way they see from the way they see it exactly. you know it, it it's their history it's not you know it's not fairy tales they're telling you poetically what what happened in the past and so that's that's where the fascination you know keeps going let me ask you, have you found, as far as keeping that information, are there families that have been entrusted with this type of historical knowledge, or is it just spread out through different types of people? No, oh, very, very much so, because um, the one thing that, you know, the standard story w would be, well, the anchor were wiped out and therefore all, all the knowledge is gone, but... The wisdom keepers knew what was going on as as the civiliz civilization was collapsing. Okay. And the most most the most important thing to keep is the history. So that would be taught, um, you know, to for a grandfather that would be taught to probably one grandson, mm -hmm. um, starting when he when he was maybe two years old. Okay. And so our friend Wilco, who lives in Cusco, has been keeping uh, a lot of the. Uh, Inca knowledge that is still remembered. He he learned it from his grandfather, and that knowledge um, has been secret for the last 500 years, be wow. because of all, all of the persecution from the church and oh, the I government and, and this and that. So now it's coming back to the surface because now there's a growing pride 
in uh, places like Cusco of the heritage of their of their people and, sure. and their great knowledge. And so, uh, Cusco is, is very much a, uh, a, a thriving Inca. It's still a thriving Inca city, which is amazing. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I'm sure that there's been some information that's been lost throughout the years. It's just you, there's just no way that that it could be retained. But luckily, what would be great, I imagine, is that they would, um, especially the more modern uh, persons that hold that knowledge, would be willing to entrust, entrust it to be written, in other words, so that it wouldn't be lost. Well, also, that's where YouTube is a, is a great tool. Yes. <clears throat> Because you, inter- I, I, you know, I get to interview some of the old people in Cusco, and, and the stories they tell—that's the oral tradition. It's, it's all coming back because now okay. they, they're starting to feel comfortable about it, and there, there is a hunger from some of the young people sure. who want to know, like, where does my family come from? And yes. you know, right, exactly, exactly, and that's that's very understandable. That's that's the the history of your country, of your people, of you know the i guess more let's let's go outside what's been put out there as the history because you know that there's right. history and then there's real history that kind of thing not what's been written about so far that was approved and like you said kind of shaped a massage to whoever was writing the history wanted it to be so right exactly that's very very understandable that sounds fascinating again thank you so much brian for spending this time with me. You have been absolutely wonderful, and I want to wish you the best of luck in all your projects. Thank you, and please invite me back in six months so we can talk Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I will, because at that time, you will be back from all your travels, so I know you're going to have lots of great stories to tell. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Oh, my God. I want to go on a plane and go. Yes. I mean, um, I've heard, you know what, that goes to show you, I, I usually, um, when it comes to his history, you know, I, I don't like to fall into that trap of believing what's been put out there as history. Because you so many times you find out that's not exactly accurate. And in some instances, it's outright lies. So I, I, I'm, I'm always like, I always want to know the real history of a place, the people, the good, bad, and the ugly. It, history is history is history is history. It is what it is, whatever. And I'm, I did not know this. I mean, to me, um, I fell into it. I felt like right, you know, up to here, you know, always thinking about as far as when you think of Peru, when you think of Machu Picchu, when you think of ancient civilizations, the only thing of you think of is Inca. That thing that is about the sacrifice. I, you know, I could see, you know, talk about character assassination for culture. Human sacrifice will do it. It will absolutely do it. And, you know, I did not know. I did not know that there was these civilizations that predated the Incas that were really the original builders. And yes, the Incas came along and maybe, you know, it's like you find this great house and then you remodel it, but it was already there or the bones of it were already there. I did not know that. I did not know that at all. So there you go. Every day you learn something new. And again, you know what? Cautionary tale. That happens more often than not. You know, where history or what's put out there and perpetuated is not exactly accurate. Somebody picked it up from somebody else and said, oh, that's the way it was and this and this and that. And then when you do the actual research or when you talk to somebody like Brian, who obviously besides the type of work he's doing lives there, and is embedded within the culture and his wife is Peruvian, gets, for lack of a better word, the inside scoop, the real truth. And then you start realizing, wait a minute, that's that's not what I thought I knew about the history of these people or this part of this country is not correct. It's not accurate. 
And like I said, I don't want the made up stuff. I want the real truth. You know, and and I was sorry to hear what he was saying, but I can understand it. What when when I said why why is there such a um, kind of a tug of war between the established uh, version of the Incas versus you know the mystery of the elongated skulls and this having been done by people that predated the Incas why would they not want this out and not surprisingly of course you know the people that were in charge or are in charge or whatever gave the first theory they don't want to backtrack they don't want to backtrack they don't want to say no we were wrong and, and we knew we were wrong for a long time and we kept on putting out the wrong version <laughs> yeah it's all about the ego Yes, even scientists have egos, sometimes have really large egos too, especially if they are the holders of the key or the experts within that field. They have a hard time going back and saying, you know what, we were wrong or we, there's more to it than that. It's like, no. Oh. So that's very, very, and of course, the work with the genetics, that, that right there is going to clear up a lot of mysteries again those bloodlines that take you back all the way to Persia okay it makes you think how did we get from Persia all the way to the coast the Pacific coast of South America and you know and, and I think I mentioned another uh, another show that they're finding you know that they're kind of having a similar thing like in some of the Polynesian Isles in New Zealand where they're find, finding proof of certain civilizations or people that predate the accepted version or history that had been put out. And it's met a lot of resistance with this new version coming out and that they're working with genetics to prove. And so I, I think that this uh, clarification <laughs> if you want to call it that is happening in a lot of different places around the world and with a lot of different cultures and um, and also it lends credence besides obviously the scientific uh, verification that something did happen you know what, what what caused these people, this diaspora of people to end up in different parts of the world, bringing knowledge, maybe not all the knowledge they had. It's almost like if you have this big, huge cataclysm going to happen and you only grab the books or the knowledge that you can, but you got to leave the bunch behind and everybody took off and hopefully you reach some place that was going to be okay. And then of course, and I'm talking here along the lines of Atlantis um, or some type of superior civilization that predates most of what we consider the major ancient civilizations. All right, whether it was what's now the Middle East, Egypt, obviously, you know, the Aztecs, Mayas, the Incas in India and Thailand that we have all these major civilizations uh, that you know that theory is that there was something that predates them by a lot when he said 12,000 years that's a long time okay that is what was it I think you you, you know you always think of I don't I don't think they even had the Bronze Age at that time in Europe you know, what is Europe now? I'm not even sure on the timing on that. You, you, you know, in other words, you're thinking of, you know, modern man, what, 12,000 years ago, uh, wearing uh, bear skins and, uh, you know, putting the fire together. <laughs> That's incredible. That's fascinating. Anyway, guys, I hope you liked the show. I loved it. I loved it. I'm going to put the links to Brian's um, website. Obviously, he's got 35 books. So take your choice. I put on the slide some of the covers of some of the books, tours. Let me tell you something. Talk about the vacation uh, or the experience that, man, talk about something different. That's That's got to be one, something to consider most definitely, myself included. Uh, check it out. Check it out. It's fascinating. And this is something that 
is an ongoing I mean believe me there's still so many answers out there that have to be found so many mysteries to be solved again guys thank you for being part of my audience catch me on Facebook Twitter Instagram true believers don't forget to send me your stories I'm getting some fantastic ones but I can always use more and again uh, as before um, I'm in the process of getting a uh, live streaming on radio and I'm going to be putting out a line for people to call in, comments, questions, stories. And you'll hear more about that because I will uh, announce that on social media as to the date and time and the phone number that you can reach me at, uh, you know, and the topic of what we're going to discuss. And uh, again, guys, I've got a lot of fantastic guests coming on. All right. Right now, when you're seeing this, this is either in preparation or right in the middle of season five yes season five of stories of the supernatural and again thank you so very very much for sharing this time with me take care